Hello, I'm Shruti and I'm back with another episode of My Second Nature. So today we're going to go behind the scenes with an author who has won multiple awards for her work. She's been recognized to be one among the top 10 young authors in India who are changing the game. I'm talking about Meghna Pant. You know, in 2012, for her debut novel, One and a Half Wife, she won the Muse India National Literary Award for Young Writers. Over the years, she's been recognized for her contribution, not just as a writer, but also as a journalist. She's been awarded the Bharat Nirman Award, the Ladley Media Award, the FICCI's Young Achievers Award, Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award, Frank O'Connor International Award, and in fact, many, many more. She even writes a regular column. In fact, we're going to talk about all of it and a lot more. So let's welcome her on My Second Nature. Hi, Meghna. How are you? I'm great, Shruti. Thanks for having me. Very excited about this talk. I know. I'm very excited about this episode as well because I have always looked up to you as, you know, like Thank a you. college ke time say as this person who is buddy <laughs> ben of like a friend. So, you know, the cool, quirky uh, elder sister you look up to. And now and you have this whole graph of a life, which to me... Like, you know, it's like two different Meghnas I associate with. So right now, it's interesting to have you right here as the author Meghna Pant and uh, not the sister of like, you know, El <laughs> oh, sort of, sort of yeah. sister, yeah. sort of yeah. smirky sister. Yeah. Like someone we go to <laughs> parties with and like hide away or like, you know, she's cool enough to come hang with us and we all chill together. <laughs> yes, time. So like that. Yeah. yeah but, Thanks, like, Shruti. <laughs> but listen, that's like the... You, how many books did you release last year? I first have to begin actually, with that because like you were dropping them like loose change. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they don't read like that. But uh, no, I mean, to be honest, uh, Boys Don't Cry actually uh, was in the making for a lot of time. We were sitting on the edits for a while. So it was actually supposed to come out before the terrible, horrible, very bad good news. Oh. And the terrible, horrible, very bad good news I wrote as a screenplay two years ago. And just, it was such a fun uh, like a story that just flowed out of me effortlessly as a book. So it was actually not supposed to even exist as a book. It was just supposed to be a screenplay. So I just wrote it on a lark and uh, uh, I love the love that that book has also gotten. Uh, so it, it released like nine months ago in April last year, but it released at the start of the second wave. So we were not able to promote it the way we wanted, obviously because of comedy and, you know, it was, it would have been very toned there for that time. Right. Uh, but hopefully we'll see it on your movie screens very, very soon. And Wait, uh, wait, pause. I think we need to <laughs> unveil this like, uh, uh, you know, question by question and get into it because you're dropping so many things right now <laughs> that it's like, wait, <laughs> let's rewind back and first go to your first book. Even before we go there, for the audience, I need to first tell you what all books have already come out. Okay, so let's see. There is The Trouble with Women, The Feminist Rani, The Holy Hundred, Happy Birthday and Other Short Stories, One and a Half Wife, the terrible, horrible, very bad good news. How to get published in India, which personally, like, thank you. I love, I love that. How she's like, uh, and now the latest <laughs> one, which is Boys Don't Cry. Oh my God. Oh I my was prepared God. for these three at least. <laughs> <laughs> so firstly, like a huge congratulations. This is from 2012 to now. This is like, so 10 years, you've been a published yeah. author for 10 years now. And like all these books, eight books within that, I'm not even counting all the other work you've done as a journalist yeah. and all the other articles and everything else, you know, the panel discussions you do and everything else that's come out. But let's rewind back to your first book. How difficult or how easy was yeah. it? How much time did it take mm -hmm. you to get into it? Just rewind back and take me through the process of when the first book came out, what was it like? So One and a Half Wife, it's actually my 10 year anniversary as an author. So thanks for pointing that out and reminding me also. It's been exactly 10 years. But Truthy, it was so, it was so different. I was such a nervous first time writer. Uh, I didn't have any president. I did, it's not like I had a literature background. I didn't have any mentors. I didn't know anybody in the publishing world. Right. Um, so, you know, actually I wrote How to Get Published because all the setbacks I faced, all the mistakes I made, all the struggles, like years of struggle of trying to understand how publishing works. <laughs> Yeah. of trying to understand how to get a book out there, how to write a proper book, how to market a book, yeah. which, you know, nobody tells you. It's a very lonely process. If you're a writer, if you're an author, um, you're pretty much by yourself and there's no hand holding, right? There's yeah. nobody who's out there who has your back. It's all 
on you. Correct. So to ease the pain, I wrote how to get published to help other authors, aspiring authors, struggling writers. And I poured myself into that book because my journey came out. Mm. Uh, but honestly, uh, I, I researched how to approach publishers for almost six months, which is one thing most authors don't do. Yeah. And they lose out because rejection files, you know, the rejection rates in India are 95%. So yeah, what? it's ninety five percent. I also didn't know it was this bad. <laughs> yeah. So how did so, you bypass uh, yeah. it? Because that's like impossible. So you know, uh, uh, aspiring authors, what happens is they're so um, uh, excited about getting their book out there and showcasing it to the world. They forget this little thing called a submission package mm. of how you have to approach the publisher, you know, your query letter and all of that. And guys, if you get that wrong, if you don't come across as professional in that one little email, then all your years of hard work, your all your dreams are going to go down and end up in that rejection slush pile or the 95% that I just mentioned. So please uh, give your dreams a chance, give yourself a chance and take out time to understand how to approach publishers, the top publishers. It's not rocket science. Go to their website, check out the submission guidelines and follow it to the T and please do research on the editor you're approaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Chiki Sarkar telling me that people would email her saying Mr. Sarkar and you know you're immediately giving away how unprofessional you are. Correct. Nobody's going to touch you with a barge pole then. So yeah. come across as strong, confident but also extremely professional and well prepared and trust me the industry is looking for new talented, fresh voices, and they'll welcome you with open arms. That's such a fresh perspective, actually, from you, because everyone I've spoken to off late, they're like, oh, it's so difficult, it's so difficult, we're just going to go the self-publishing way, because it's just an easier yeah. route, because otherwise, you know, you don't even hear from anyone for like six months, eight months, and then you just keep waiting. So this is actually yeah. a very proper way of going about it. So, of course, you didn't have all this when you started 10 years back. Right. But I, I knew I, I knew that I'll only get become a writer if I get published by the top publisher. I was very, very sure of that. So I spent six months actually actually researching how to approach publishers. Hmm. And then on eleventh Jan in 2011, when I was living in Dubai, at 11, 11, that's those are my lucky numbers. 1, 11, 11, 11. Whenever I start seeing those numbers, I, I literally, I, that's when I do my most productive work and good news comes to me. So I sent all those emails out. They were all like, you know, ready to go in my draft pile. And I sent them all out at 11, 11 and the rest of them at 1, 11. And I sat in a cafe, I bunked work that day. And I sent them all out. And two hours I heard back from Westlin saying, send us a full manuscript. We loved uh, your sample chapter. So, oh, but wow. trust, yeah. Yeah. But Shruti, it took, it took six months of researching how to approach them correctly for me to get there. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, there's a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes. So anyone who thinks, oh, wow, she got lucky. Well, luck is just, you know, it's just a statement which once it happens, it seems lucky. But actually, the, <laughs> the only, research, yeah, that's gone behind. The it. only author who's got lucky has been Chetan Bhagat. I can tell you that. The rest of us have put in a lot, <laughs> a lot of hard work, like obscene amount of hard work. That's crazy. That's crazy. Today, looking yeah. back, 10 years have happened, eight books have come out. Uh, do you think you even face it today? Like today, as an author, what is the biggest issue that you have in your life when you're writing a book and then when you're actually going and approaching people? Is there any downside to it, being a celebrated author? I think now it's become much easier. In fact, publishers approach me. They're looking, they ask me if I have anything, uh, you know, that I'm working on. Uh, so it's a very sweet spot to be on. But trust me, again, like I mentioned, it's taken, you know, a decade of hard work of, of building a certain kind of reputation. The one thing I hear from all publishers that I work with, I've, I've published books with Westland, with Doomsbury, uh, mostly Penguin, like mo majority of my books have come out with Penguin and all of them, all the editors and across the team, they've unanimously told me one thing that Megna, you're the most professional, one of the most professional writers we've worked with. Uh, because it's ache to stick to deadlines. And this is such a basic thing, right? I mean, I'm a, I am have a corporate background. I have an MBA. So for, and, and, and I worked as a journalist where you're running against time all the time. Right. So for me, it's an un implicit thing that, of course, you're professional. Of course, you stick to guidelines and really? deadlines and all of that. But apparently other people don't. So if you're going to set out to be an author who wants to cement themselves in the industry, again, not only be professional, but please stick to deadlines. Uh, please treat everyone across the board nicely. I think one thing that most publishers complain about is that authors treat them as their enemies. You know, <laughs> But they're not. They're actually your friends. They're you're out there to help team. you to take your... Yeah, yeah you're part of yeah. a team. So stop yeah. you know, treating them like they're against you or... Uh, remember they have hundreds of books coming out a month right, right. so for them to give you uh, a certain they can only have a limited marketing budget they only have a limited social media space for your book so 
don't begrudge them that. That's all I want to say, you know. And and please be nice to everybody, including the salespeople, the distributors, because they're all working so hard to, you know, to take uh, literature forward in India. So we're all a team. We're all in this together. That's one thing a lot of uh, even very successful authors oftentimes forget. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I'm going to get deeper into your process. Because, you know, right now we've been talking about the outside things of, you know, the way the whole thing functions, of, of being an author, of books coming out. But in personal space with you, when you begin to write a book, and for the first time, every time you begin a new book, is there a certain process that you follow? Or is there, you know, kuch log hote hai, go ab bhag gaye. Ya, ya, you know, they want to <laughs> run away to the mountains and like, you know, they need their solitude. But you, yeah. uh, it, during the lockdown, I know you also had your second daughter and you must yes. have been very, very busy with like one baby, one toddler at home. So two children running around helter skelter and yet you were managing to write so much. So is there a process yeah. that you follow? How has that process changed or evolved over the years? So the one thing I have to admit about myself as a writer is that I am my most productive under duress. So when I had very small children, so the pandemic started when my second daughter was a month and a half old and my older one was just two and a half years old. So imagine I'm stuck with this hyper toddler at home <laughs> and a newborn baby yeah. and I didn't have help. I only had one house help. So uh, it, it was a time of extreme exhaustion, sleeplessness. And honestly, the only thing that kept me sane was writing. So I turn to writing as solace. So for me, it's not a burden, it's uplifting. You know, it, 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 I need my mind and my soul uh, to be poured into something right. um, aside from real life and as, mm. even aside from my children. And I think that's one thing that what really drove me forward is people told me that Meghna, you'll be out of commission for five years after having kids. They're like, Abhi tu saal bas ghar pe be. Oh my God. So many people told <laughs> me that and educated, even my author friends told me that. And that really irked me. You know, I'm a feminist also. And that, yeah. that statement really irked me. And I said, you know, up to dikha ke hi rahunge, ki aap new mothers ko mat bolo ki aap kya kar sakte aur kya nahi kar sakte. And I was on a vengeance. So I, I was overworking. I didn't sleep. I, uh, but honestly, it, it, I don't know. I just, it kept me sane. It kept me happy. It kept me very productive. Yeah. My kids are happier for it because they have a happy mother. And I always tell all my, uh, new mothers that, you know, all kids need is their mother, their parents to be happy, to be there for them. Yeah. And they don't need a lot of the, you know, frivolities that we've now attached to parenting, unfortunately. Right, right. And uh, also, I, I would like to add here that uh, just for the audience people who are looking right now at her and saying, wow, she has a life sorted. Everything is so good. Everything is like, you know, in place. Uh, the deeper you go into her books, <laughs> you will realize the kind of hardship you have faced, which is what actually I want to talk about. But before that, I want to get a little into the latest book. Read an excerpt from there as we usually do on this podcast. So both of us are together oh. going to read like a little excerpt. And then we're going to move forward. And I know I will have like a ton of questions after that. So let's Great. get into that. Boys Don't Cry by Meghna Pant. The cuts were not deep. I wanted to kill myself, but not enough to die. I couldn't understand this complex misery, but there were two cuts on my left wrist and they were throbbing in pain. I went and lay down next to Sunit. I told myself the pain would go away because my mind was in more agony than my body. It didn't. I needed medical aid. I cut my wrist. I said softly to Sunit, can you get me some Dettol? He woke up with a start and blinked in confusion. He didn't comprehend what I was saying till he saw my wrists. Oh my God, what have you done? It's nothing, it was very stupid. He frowned. Can you get gauze and Dettol and something sweet for me to drink? I can't stand up. I feel like I'm going to faint. Sunit stood up and the words that came out of his mouth were, what the fuck, Meghna? You know, we don't have insurance. I stood in the middle of an ice cold highway facing an ice cold storm. And this man was throwing an ice cold bucket of water on me. There was no panic in his eyes. There was no empathy. He didn't hug me. He didn't console me. He didn't shout at me for being foolish. He didn't even get what I asked for. My husband really didn't care whether I lived or died. I'm going to call my parents and call yours. Let's tell them what you've done, he said instead. What the fuck was wrong with this man? Please don't tell anyone, I said emphatically. Don't you dare. 
but Sunit ran to the bedroom and within seconds his parents came out. Fuck, now I really wish that I'd killed myself. His father sat down beside me on the futon. His mother stood next to him. I cringed. This was the weakest moment of my life and these were the last people I wanted to see. If at that point anyone had asked me if I recommended falling in love, I would have told them, run. Because here I was with my chest cut open, my heart cut open, allowing people to get in and break me so wide open that nothing inside me could live again. All because I'd let myself love. Why did you call us for this nonsense, Sunit? I heard his mother say. What drama is this? Cutting her wrists. If she really wanted to kill herself, she would have done it properly, no? The anchor pulling me down into the deep sea now sank me completely. She's doing this so I look bad. Our family looks bad. Don't go by her innocent face. She'll do anything to get everyone to take her side. She's doing all this for attention. You are giving it to her. Mark, please, Sunit finally said. But it was again too little, too late. It dawned on me that Sunit had called his parents here for entertainment. As if I was a circus performer and not to help. How deep is the absence of love? I got up, slowly. I would not let myself fall further than I had these awful people. I had to save myself. None of them would. I hobbled to the kitchen, holding the wall, and drank a few sips of coke so I wouldn't collapse. Feeling slightly better, I went into the bathroom and began to put debt all on my cuts. It sinked. Sunit came up to me and said, I've called your mother. She's on the phone. What do you do when you ask for the cool of the moon, but get burnt by the scorching sun? I took the phone and shut the bathroom door. I heard my mother's voice. She was in panic. What's going on, beta? Are you okay? Are you okay? That's all I needed to hear. I wiped my tears. I cleared my throat. I forced myself to say something. Mom, I really can't talk right now. Pita, please, tell me you're okay. Tell me you didn't do what he's saying you did. I took a deep breath. There was only so much I could process at a time. Mom, I don't want to talk about this right now, but I'm okay. Sunit so said something about you. She couldn't even say it. How could she when I couldn't say it either? I don't know what's going on there, Manu, she added. But if you want to come back to Mumbai, take the next flight and come here to us. I wanted to sob. There was nothing I would have liked more. But going back to Mumbai was to admit defeat, to admit failure. I wasn't ready for that. My mother had raised me to be a strong woman. I didn't know then that being strong could also mean being vulnerable. Listen, this is really, really powerful. Like I, while you were reading, I, I literally had goosebumps. Uh, okay, now, first and foremost, <laughs> is this real? Like, did this actually happen to you? What part of it is fiction? And what part of it is just inspired? And how much of it is real? You know, it, it makes me so angry reading this 14 years later. It's all real. It's what happened to me. It's what I went through. And of course, it was, you know, it's, it's been more than a decade. And I should have process i have processed it i have healed i have married to a wonderful man now yeah. i have two beautiful children uh and i'm a very happy positive person uh but it's it makes me angry because this was who i was and this was I, even at that time i was a modern educated uh you know in financially emotionally uh physically independent woman and i still put up with this from an abusive man this kind of physical, emotional abuse and financial abuse, by the way, which no one talks about yeah. uh, for five years. And I don't recognize this person anymore. Uh, and I know it was, you know, at that time, my life seemed very chaotic and messy and not even worth living. Yeah. But it was all a design to lead me to where I am today. Correct. So I have literally like a lotus grows in a swamp and or despite the uh, swamp, in spite of the swamp, for me, that's my life that, uh, you know, you don't see all the muck that's happened below the surface. Uh, but I am not going to show any, I didn't want to show anyone that side because I wanted them to see that out of great tragedy comes great beauty. And yeah. we all, I, we all, I mean, in our own ways have gone through so much tragedy, right? In some way or the other, life gets to us all. It Correct. will, Correct. if it hasn't yet, right? Yeah. It does. Yeah, it takes absolutely. us all down in some way and yeah. you have to find the, your way out. 
you know with all these complex emotions and you're so right it is there's emotional there is verbal abuse there is physical abuse and then there is once all of it is over it is not easy the abuse still continues in the head even if the situation changes and it takes a really long time for a person to heal and i know for a fact that if one little chapter one excerpt that you've read can touch me like this i know people who are reading the book they must be relating to it on many yeah. many levels you're a believer of science how you said about 111 so i know for a fact that you believe in the whole what you put out the right people yeah. find it right and people gravitate to what they need and i know for a fact there's a number of people who must be gravitating to the healing that you're providing by this book uh, have yeah. people come up to you and spoken about it because i'm sure Absolutely. it it must be touching many raw nerves so in that case just yeah. the way you have healed it's easy to open a wound but at that point it's very important to heal you know so while reading a book Absolutely. it might it might prick me what do you do in that situation because there must be so many people reaching out to help you know for help to yeah. you and that's a very big burden to carry so what do you do then uh, you know i've been talking about domestic violence and abuse for so many years now my the first article i wrote it took me 8 years to be able to write that article was for femina i remember and it opened like a floodgate of emotions i was inundated with dms uh, from women all over the country yeah. and it broke my heart a celebrated uh, actor called me up and she said uh, her husband's also very famous she said he threw me out of a moving car uh, a, a dancer girl emailed me um, sorry messaged me saying uh my boyfriend broke my spine and i can't dance anymore my career my life my body everything is over and people i knew people i never expected i mean powerful strong happy looking women were messaging me calling me when they met me face to face they would confess that they've been through the same thing yeah. it's so prevalent and nobody nobody's talking about it because somehow the onus has come on the women ki tumhari galti hai Yeah. you deserved it or you asked for it and i by the way a lot of people told me this huh? mm. when i uh, finally uh, ended that chapter in my life a lot of people said that oh you must same thing you must be doing it for attention you must have provoked him you have asked for it ek haath se taali nahi bajti lot of all this yeah. Uh, yeah and i used to believe that i was gaslit so badly that i thought ki ek to abuse ho nahi raha i you won't believe it you will laugh if i tell confess that i thought i was not in an abusive marriage for 5 years I thought कि this is normal ये हर घर में होता है या पति और पत्नी के बीच में होता है because that's the narrative that was fed to me correct by that by my perpetrator yeah yeah and I thought कि मैं ये कुछ गलत कर रही हूँ society also society is well who do you go and talk to who do you go and talk to कोई अभी तो of course things have changed women have started speaking up people don't tolerate nonsense anymore yeah uh, but at that time this was uh, you know again let's remember this was thirteen fourteen years back uh, but honestly sometimes i feel like things have changed sometimes i feel things haven't because seeing the number of stories that are tumbling out yeah. my friends who've never i didn't even know have gone through abuse have been messaging me that they were moved by the book but fortunately guys one thing i have to say because i know i'm not giving away the end but it's right at the beginning i kill off the guy <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't happen <laughs> unfortunately that didn't happen uh, but <laughs> you know this redemption so my entire premise was ki yaar Yes, bad things have happened to you, but yeah. trust me, karma is a bitch. She will take care of you. <laughs> so you know, you do what comes to you, yeah. and you want to get revenge. You get revenge. You want to just step out and keep yourself safe. You do what comes to you. What suits you? What suits your lifestyle? What suits your temperament? Correct. But uh, in this book, I've got my revenge because I never got a sorry, not even a simple humble sorry in real life. So uh, fact, don't mess with women. I was about to ask that. <laughs> that are you today yeah. in like I don't know if it's too personal. Let me know that are you yeah. in good relations with your ex or is it like a complete? Oh my god! No. I mean, it's impossible to be if this is a reality. If this was the scenario, no. right? So if uh, yeah, yeah. Do you ever wonder that if he's reading it or if he's uh, what if he comes back and how does your yeah. and i know you're very happily married and i've met your husband and he's amazing he's a very gentle kind <laughs> soul yeah. right in that very brief meeting i could figure that so how yeah. how do you deal with that like how does your husband deal with yeah. it and show sure he's a good support system but still in your yeah. own head to know that the life you're leading today what if yeah. it's threatened by your past do you ever think about that i do but the one thing i'll say is ki i am not going to be scared anymore I refuse to be cowed down. I refuse to be a coward. I refuse to be threatened by anybody anymore. Yeah. I have gone through that that process. I've been the coward. I've been the 
failure. I've, I've been, I have failed. I have been through the process of failing myself as a woman, yeah. as a human being. And I will not never, ever subject myself to that again, no matter what the consequences are. Right. For me, my redemption is in honesty. I know what I've been through. Yeah. And uh, my redemption is in the fact that you try to break me. You try, you push me to a point where someone like me, you knew me from before, like you yeah. said, right? Shruti, yeah. I was one, I'm a happy person. I've always yeah. been a very happy person. Yeah. Uh, you and a very broke strong my woman. soul. Yeah, and a very, a very strong, strong woman. Yeah. We used to look up to you for that. So for you having, you know, if you've yeah. gone through this, and I didn't know this. So when right now I'm reading this with you, and I'm wondering, but that girl who I knew yeah. would have never stood for something like that. So if yeah. someone like you could go through this, which means it comes in so silently that you don't even realize. Yeah. And under the name of love, we'll end yes. up doing many things, saying yeah. it's okay. But when you finally broke out of it, yeah, the moment you decided that's it, no more. I know it would have taken a lot of guts and a lot of fear and coming out of it. So people who are still stuck in that loop, what is the one single piece of advice, not minding the world, not bothering about them, but what they need to tell themselves to get out of that situation from your situation? What is that one thing that you'd want to share with them? The first thing I would say is distance yourself from a perpetrator. If you have children, get them out of his, uh, you know, out of his line of sight so that there's no harm can come to you. Okay. Because you're still obviously still, you're going to live in fear with that person yeah. uh, for a few, for a little bit of time. Uh, the second thing I'll say is heal yourself. It, no matter what it takes, uh, you know, give yourself time. Don't be hard on yourself. You've had someone who has stripped away all your self-confident, all your self-belief. You are shattered. Collect those broken pieces of yourself and put yourself back together so strong now that nobody can ever touch you again. Yeah. You have to be bulletproof. You have to be titanium, you know, to, to take words from that song. Yeah. Uh, and whatever it takes, whatever your healing process is, for me, it was writing. Mm. Find it and don't apologize for it. You know, if you, if you want to become a sexual deviant, if you want to go like, uh, go on a spiritual break, if you want to go travel the world for a year, if you want to, whatever you want to do, you do that and you be unapologetic. You do not owe anyone anything anymore. Okay. So you be there for yourself because trust me, even if you have a support system, if you're fortunate enough, you will, by the end, you're there for yourself only. So don't ever forget that. Okay. And, and just trust me, you look at me, I'm happy, I'm smiling. And I was two, three years after I came, pulled myself out of the situation. It took time, of course, even for someone as strong as me. Yeah. But if I can do it, you can do it. You yeah. will be happy. You will get your happiness. You will get your life back in order. Just give yourself time to heal and be very kind to yourself. Please, you deserve it. Yes. And if nothing else, <laughs> not in real, at least in fiction, kill the person. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think a lot of women may want to kill their exes by the way a lot of guys also a lot of guys have written yeah. to me that they've also been in abusive situations yeah. so yeah, yeah. which know. is why I yeah. said people earlier because I know yeah, that yeah. in today's day and age men women don't matter everyone yeah I mean it's just a state you could find yourself in and it doesn't even have to be a relation of a husband and wife it could be any kind of relation but as long as Absolutely. you're going through it and like you know you know your truth the most so deal with that yeah. but now let's come back to the book you wrote this book in how much time? Boys Don't Cry took you how long? Uh, 14 years of actually going through it. Yeah. Uh, eight years of finding, gathering the courage to write it. Uh, I started writing it uh, <laughs> when I was pregnant with my second baby, uh, with Arya. And uh, my husband was like, right now, why do you want to get into this? So how to get published? My book had just got published. I finished promoting it. This was in April and I found out uh, the next month that I'm pregnant. And I'd had a miscarriage before that. So, you know, I had given myself that time till April, nine months when the baby would, my second, uh, technically my second baby would have been born. I'd given myself that nine month period for my womb to be empty. You know, right. Because that was the space for me, visually right. that the baby would have occupied. Correct. So my rainbow baby, then I was pregnant with her and uh, my husband was like, why do you want to, and I was taking a break from work uh, anyway. I was like, I was not going on liter literature festivals. I was just, you know, kind of taking it easy. Correct. And my husband was like, why are you getting, why do you want to, you know, tap into these emotions at this time because, yeah. you know, you're digging out a part of yourself that you you have tried so long to forget. Uh, but for me, it was very therapeutic. I, I just had, this was a book that has been in the making for more than a decade. And I knew one day I'm going to write a book like this. And I was like, abhi nahi to kabhi nahi. Huh. So I got down to it. I finished writing it and I sent it to Kanishka Gupta, who's my agent. Uh, 
I think just uh, literally just I think the week when uh, my baby was born. Wow. This so two years just, ago. Yeah, two years ago. <laughs> wow. Yeah. This is quite yeah. something. So now with all of it, with all the body of work and earlier, right on the start, you had just mentioned that you are maybe going to turn it into a movie. So what is next? What are we looking forward to? How many of your books are going to come out? As movies? <laughs> so what is, what is the scene on yeah. that? What is the scene on that? Uh, so the terrible, horrible, very bad good news, as you guys know, uh, it was it's already like a, it was written as a screenplay called Badnam Lardu. Again, it was a, it's but it's a comedy. It's the first and only book I've written that's uh, you know very humorous. Right. Um, and that is should uh, Balaji's Bling has picked it up, so it's under development and should be out hopefully by end of this year, next year. Huh. And Boys Don't Cry has, by the way, uh, the book came out on Monday, seventeenth January. Right. By f- that Friday, I was already signing a contract for the f- movie rights. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> so I, I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal the details very soon online. But all I want to say is that somebody from a, a very big production house read the book. by, And she was like, I was up the whole night on Monday. I got the book. I was up the whole night on and Tuesday morning. She called me and said, you have to give me the film rights for this because I, I have that sensibility to make this the best mm. film ever. Hmm. So uh, touch wood, guys, and uh, I, I, really I love the love that, that I'm getting. Yeah, and I've got amazing. actresses messaging me saying, "Please cast me." <laughs> I've never had this kind of experience before. I was like, "Wow, this is a <laughs> new life spot to be in." <laughs> new life, yeah. <laughs> amazing. So, when do you? Now I know if we if we go through all your books, you know, there is a very strong uh, feminism message. There is a very strong. A lot of them, I feel, come from your personal life and everything that you have overcome. And today, you're stronger for. And that's what you're picking different bits of what you've experienced and creating like these beautiful little books out of it, right? So <laughs> when do you think this, when are you going to move out of this genre and what is the other genre that you want to explore? Is there any such even thought right now? Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm working Shruti on this young adult, very fun uh, novel right now, which is also right. going to, again, I'm re- writing it as a screenplay and a novel simultaneously. Right. Um, and it's a fun, it's like, uh, you know, sort of Glee meets uh, Parent Trap meets uh, Mean Girls. So it's a really fun, fun wow. uh, book. I, yeah, I'm yeah, it's all about like... 14, 15 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and the second one I'm working on is actually a thriller inspired. I won't reveal too many details because still the concept, I don't want someone to steal it. Yes, but yes. it's a very fun, th- it's a thriller with a ghost and everything. So uh, uh, that's I'm very excited. early in, in the works. Yeah. Yes, yes. So thriller and a young adult. So very different from all what I've written before. Fantastic. <laughs> I think we're super going to be looking forward to all this. Of course, if you're sitting there wondering, listen, I want all these books. I want to read all of them. I'm going to leave the description right below. You can go click there and you can go visit uh, uh, Meghna Pan's website. All the links are present over there. I'm going to leave all the details down below. So don't worry about that. But Meghna, Thank you so much for coming today, sharing, you know, your, your work, not just that, even your private life and being so expressive and open about it, because I know the message needs to reach out there to as many people yeah. and, you know, the support that they can seek. So thank you so much for being you and like, of course, <laughs> coming on the podcast and having a chat with you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Shruti, for having me. I'm so glad we did this. Uh, I and uh, I look forward to listening to this and watching it. And for whoever's out there, guys, be true to yourselves, keep shining and uh, don't take life too seriously. None of us get out of it alive. So just enjoy what you have and live in the moment. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Thank you.